I'm going to tell you a story that's as true as I know how to make it. I don't have a background in ethnomathematics or the history of mathematics or the history of math education, so please forgive any mistakes, omissions, distortions, or mispronunciations, and let me know about them. The story I'm going to tell is as old as civilization, or at least as old as money, because as long as currency has existed in different denominations, there's always been a need to make change and to find systems for making change efficiently and accurately. The story I'm about to tell involves many parts of the world over the course of many centuries, and in many ways, it's a story about sand. The first mathematical popularizer was Archimedes, with a work called The Sand Reckoner. He wanted to show that the mind could stretch itself to encompass things that might seem too vast for mere humans to contemplate, such as the number of grains of sand it would take to fill the universe. He came up with a number system that could be considered a version of base 10,000. 10,000 is a pretty big base to use. The Babylonians used base 60, which is still on the big side, but better. They used place value, but they didn't have a zero, which made their system a bit awkward. And yet, even if zero wasn't present in the way people wrote numbers in Babylonia and elsewhere, it was latent in the devices people used for calculating with numbers. The word calculus refers to a small pebble of the kind found in versions of the abacus used all over the world that involved moving pebbles in grooves rather than sliding beads along rods. An empty groove is, in effect, a zero, even if one doesn't create a name for the absence of pebbles there. We can thank Brahmagupta and his fellow Indian mathematicians for creating the modern theory of place value with zeros. And we can thank Al-Khwarizmi and other mathematicians of the Arab world in Northern Africa and Western Asia for adopting and adapting the system and making possible its importation to Europe by way of the Italian thinker Leonardo of Pisa. I don't know how many of you heard Keith Devlin's recent talk at MoMath, but he argued that Leonardo of Pisa, better known as Fibonacci, was sort of the Steve Jobs of the decimal system he didn't invent it, but he perfected, packaged, and promulgated it in a way that greatly benefited society. So, when the scientific revolution got underway in Europe, our system of representing numbers was ready for it. Thanks to Leibniz and Newton, the early insights of Archimedes were codified in the differential and integral calculus. Calculus! Those little stones again. Isaac Newton once wrote, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Leibniz had his own approach to the ocean of truth. He imagined that all truths could be known if we only had the right language. As part of his search for the right ways to express concepts of all kinds, including numbers, he invented the binary system, while acknowledging its roots in the I Ching, a millennia-old Chinese system of divination. Fast forward a few centuries, past the invention of the calculus, and we find the countries of Newton and Leibniz engaged in a war of unprecedented scale. Ironically, one of the tools enlisted in that war was a marriage of the ballistic equations of Newton and the binary logic of Leibniz, the ENIAC computer, whose original purpose was to calculate artillery firing tables for the U.S. Army. The war ended, but the computer stayed with us, for good and ill. In the post-war era, a Belgian educator named Frédéric Papy was inspired by the manipulatives he saw in use, things like the base 10 blocks popularized by Hungarian mathematician Zoltan Dienz. But he felt that something was missing from existing approaches to making students' number work concrete. The geometrical specificity of the shapes of these objects disguises the uniformity of the place value system from one place to the next. Papi devised a pedagogical binary computer made of paper and counters in the hope that playful exploration of base 2 would give students a deeper understanding of positional representation. Papi in turn inspired another educator, but before I get to that part of the story, let's jump back to the era right before Newton and Leibniz, when the study of probability was initiated by Pascal and Fermat. In the ancient China that gave us the I Ching, randomness was seen as a message from divine powers. In late Renaissance Europe, randomness played a less exalted role in games of chance. Pascal had been asked by a nobleman gambler to do a present value analysis of an interrupted game of chance, and the theory of probability began to take shape. Now zoom forward to the 20th century again, past Papi, into the 1970s, as German mathematician Arthur Engel, teaching probability theory to fourth graders in the U.S., seeks a concrete way to help children make sense of random processes. The Papi computer is in Engel's mind as an example of the kind of concreteness he seeks, and he comes up with a device of his own, his probabilistic abacus, which he later renamed the stochastic abacus, 
but which I think should be called the Engel Machine. You can read about Engel Machines in the August 2017 issue of my blog, or from videos on my Barefoot Math YouTube channel. I became aware of Engel Machines a couple of decades ago and gave a talk about them at a math circle in Boston, where a brilliant teacher from down under named James Tanton already had a head full of ideas about how to enliven the K-12 curriculum. I gave a talk about crazy stuff like base three halves, which you can read about in the September 2017 issue of my blog. Base three halves was just one idea too many to reside in James's head without causing all of his ideas to explode outward. Kapow! You may think you know the rest of my tale, but I haven't told you the full backstory of my math circle talk. Part of what excited me about Engel machines was their connection with something called the Abelian Sandpile Model. In the 1980s, the Danish physicist Per Bach, the Chinese physicist Chao Tang, and the American physicist Kurt Wiesenfeld had come up with the Abelian Sandpile Model as a way of beginning to think about the phenomenon of self-organization in physical systems. Interestingly, something extremely close to the Sandpile Model was independently invented by mathematicians at about the same time. The American mathematician Joel Spencer, working right here at the Courant Institute, was studying a class of mathematical games he called pusher-chooser games. And this led Swedish mathematician Anders Björner, Hungarian mathematician Laszlo Lovas, and American mathematician Peter Shore to investigate what are now called chip-firing games. Spencer, Lovas, and Shore went on to write a really fun article with Richard Anderson, Eva Tardosh, and Shmuel Winograd that I recall reading with great pleasure when it appeared. Angle machines, the sand pile model, and chip firing are basically three different ways of looking at the same kind of process. The Indian physicist Deepak Dar brought his own insights to the study of sand piles. He was among the first researchers to explore the idea that sand, or at least an idealized mathematical version of sand, was latently a computational medium. There's a wonderful saying from the early computer age, we have tamed lightning and we are using it to teach sand to think. But one might ask, what does sand already know, even before we turn it into silicon and teach it our mathematics? It knows how to flow, but not just steadily. It knows how to flow in fits and starts, just as the boxes in exploding dots fill and explode and fill again, and just as neuronal membranes polarize and discharge and polarize again. Comparing sand piles to the brain is pretty speculative stuff. I think it's too soon for us to know how much there is to it. In any case, leaving aside possible applications to physical systems, the mathematics of sand piles is in an exciting stage. The model in its simplest form is just as simple as can be. We have an infinite array of squares with one square that we call the center, and we pile grains of sand on the center square, adding one grain at a time, and another, and another, subject to the rule that when any square contains four or more grains, kapow, we send a single grain to each of the four neighboring squares, and we let that keep on happening until every square has three or fewer grains before we add any more grains to the center square. We do this again and again and again. Add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, kapow! Add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, kapow! Add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, add a grain, kapow! 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 Add a grain. Okay, I think you get the idea. Mathematically speaking, that's all there is to the process. To make it more easily absorbed by our brains, we use colors. Each square gets one of four colors, according to whether the number of grains there is zero, one, two, or three. In fact, we can get rid of the dots entirely and just use colors. Such a simple rule, but such complex behavior. From this seed, a world grows. Different researchers use different colors. It's just a matter of aesthetic preference. Once the picture grows large enough, you have to choose whether to focus on the big picture or on close-ups that show intricate structures that get more and more intricate over time. There are patterns and there are defects in the patterns that are governed by patterns of their own. Our computers do huge calculations and show us beautiful pictures of the way the model behaves when the number of grains is in the millions, billions, or trillions, numbers we humans reckon as being large. Yet, for the most part, our mathematics doesn't let us prove that what we see in our pictures is what goes on in really big sand piles. We think 
that as sand piles get ever larger, they should look just the way they do in our pictures, only more so. But it's possible that we're very wrong. Funny things can happen on the way to infinity. It's conceivable that our pictures are a woefully misleading reflection of our own finitude and the cosmic smallness of our computers and their calculations. But you shouldn't think that we're not making progress. We are. We have some theorems now that tell us that our pictures aren't completely lying to us. What's strange and wonderful is where those theorems come from. It turns out that all sorts of different branches of mathematics, seemingly treating entirely different sorts of mathematical objects, feed into the study of the Sandpal model. Some of the foundational work was done here at NYU by former Courant postdocs Charles Smart and Wes Pegnan in collaboration with Lionel Levine. The fractal structure of Sandpals is governed by the fractal structure of what are called Apollonian circle packings in a far-off field of mathematics. This is a story that's still being written, and your students and their students may help write it. We especially need more women writing this story. I'm sorry there haven't been more women in this talk, but it's not just my fault. It's a global problem. An alien intelligence eavesdropping on our world's scientific progress is likely to conclude that we're not very serious about answering important questions because to a large extent, we're still only using half of the available intellectual workforce. Actually, much less than half. Think of all the other underrepresented groups who aren't included in the story I've told you. Overlooking the people who are missing from a story is unfortunately as easy as overlooking the pebbles that are missing from a groove. We need to fix that. Naming the problem is a start. Exploding dots uses classic powerful ideas like chip trading and weds them to the power of modern educational technologies, whiteboards, laptops, and smartphones, without leaving behind the millions of students who only have access to the oldest mathematical technology we have, moving things around, whether we call them dots or pebbles or chips or tokens or counters. And what do the students get out of it? I'll quote Keith Devlin. Exploding dots does nothing for the expert because it represents on a page what the expert has in their mind. But that is why it can be so effective in assisting a learner arrive at that level of understanding. I think Keith might say that James Tanton is a worthy follower of Leonardo of Pisa. One thing I love about exploding dots is that it's not an algorithm. You don't have a list of steps to follow in a prescribed order. What you have instead are options and opportunities. It's a garden of forking and merging paths that all miraculously converge to the same final answer. The human spirit requires that kind of freedom, especially the spirits of young learning humans. I've tried to show that exploding dots has roots in the ancient idea of making change, woven together with newer ideas from all around the world about computation and chance, and that these themes have come together in a beautiful mathematical tapestry that is still being woven. And speaking of making change, the Global Math Project is about making a change in the way teachers and students think about math by sharing an exalting and open-ended vision of mathematics as a growing subject whose most exciting years are still ahead of us. I hope that Global Math Week 2018, 2019, and beyond share other beautiful mathematical stories with millions of kids. Newton's Great Ocean of Truth isn't just great, it's fantastic, and it's time everyone got invited to jump in.